especially from the words of Jesus. We get them from faithful believers and leaders who draw wisdom from God. And we get them from the Holy Spirit. There's lots of places in the world that will offer you answers. But those are the places that give you answers that will never let you down, right? Those are the holy answers that we can trust. So last week we saw where Paul answered the question that they had about celibacy, which turned into a bit of a marriage versus singleness kind of discussion. And this week, Paul's going to move on to another question as we continue in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And again, we don't really see what the question was at, exactly what it is. But if I were to put it into words, I think it would sound like this. As new Christians, should we change our status or life situation in order to follow Jesus? And that might sound like a weird question to you, like why would you have to change your life situation to follow Jesus? But remember that these Christians in Corinth were radically different than they had been before. I like to call that the BC years. Does anybody else have BC years? Like before Christ, I was like this, but after Christ, I'm like this, right? And so, so their behaviors and their character are becoming more and more like Jesus. They're changing radically on the inside. And so I guess it makes sense that they're saying, do we need to change things on the outside as well? Things like their, um, their situation or their job or their engagement, or do we need to move to Jerusalem? Or do we need, what do we got to do to really follow Jesus? And so I like to call this question, should I stay or should I go now? I'll give you a minute to think of the song, okay? <laughs> and I think that we're going to find that Paul's answer is helpful to us as well as it was to them. Mostly, I think, because it's a reminder to us to stay focused on what's important, okay? So if you want to read along with me, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm reading from the New Living, Test, um, the New Living Translation starting with verse 17. we got to find it first. There we go. Here's what he says. Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it, and the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. So let's stop there for a minute. So you see what he's saying. And remember that, that in these days that some of the Jewish believers thought that in order to become a Christian, you had to become Jewish first. So they wanted all the Gentiles to get circumcised to show that they were now a part of this people. And so Paul is saying that that doesn't matter, right? That you should remain as God called you. So what's on the outside does not matter compared to what's on the inside. Now, I'm sure that that not, wouldn't have held true if, if they were in a situation that was disobedient. Okay, so you couldn't have been like working in the pagan temple. Probably as a new Christian, you wouldn't want to stay there. So certainly there are times when the situation does need to change in order to be obedient to God. But Paul is saying that God saved them for who they are and where they are for a reason, and they don't have to change that. And that must have seemed really radical to those, especially to those Jewish Christians who thought that they needed to be circumcised. But Paul's saying, you know what? God called you as a Gentile. He didn't call you to be a Jew. He called you to follow him. And so it doesn't matter. What matters is your relationship with Jesus. And so he says that the important thing is to keep God's commandments. And that's exactly what Jesus came to help everyone do. Don't try to become something that you're not. Instead, stay where you are. Embrace your calling where it is. 
And then he goes on to use an example of slavery, which was a common condition at the time. And remember that people often went into slavery in those days to settle debts or to have a more secure economic condition. Sometimes a slave actually had a higher status than a non-slave, depending on who they worked for. So if you remember Joseph in Potiphar's house, Joseph had a lot of respect in that position and a lot of power in that position. Not that it was the best position, but I think that um, when, when Paul writes this, he's not necessarily thinking about abusive relationships that we tend to associate with slavery. This was a different kind of slavery. So let's read the next few verses. Verse 20 says, yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. If you get a chance to be free, take it. But remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you are free when the Lord called you, then you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Does that even make sense? I think it does, right? Because what he's saying is the kind of freedom that Jesus brings is not freedom from slavery in the world's eyes. It's freedom for your soul, right? And so he says certainly that if you could be free of, in, of slavery physically, that would be a great thing because then you could do more to serve the kingdom. But that doesn't give you permission to, to run away or to break your agreement with someone or to not be godly where you are. Certainly there are some of us who have been in jobs that felt a lot like that, right? <laughs> And maybe we're thinking, man, if I could only be free from that. But he's saying that if you're enslaved, keep serving God right where you are. And remember that in some respects, everybody is a slave who has come to Christ because we have surrendered our freedoms to him. We don't make our own decisions. We don't get to decide what's good and what's bad. We don't get to decide how we should live so much as we give it all to Christ. And dedicate it to him. And so in that respect, we are all slaves of Christ. But at the same time, we are all free in him. Because we are free from the condemnation that the world brings. Free from the destiny of hell that we were on. He paid the ransom for us so that we could belong to God's kingdom. And so in that text, Paul says twice... Stay right where you are and serve him. Did you hear that? This is like the third time we've, we've seen it already, right? Stay wherever you are. And then he turns to a related question, which sounds a lot like what we've talked about already, and, but this is about for those who are engaged. So, so there are some couples who are engaged to one another, and what they're saying is, so should we not get married because of Jesus, or should we get married, right? And so... Um, imagine the stress of not knowing, you know, well, we were just getting ready to marry and we were, had this whole life planned and now, now there's this whole Jesus thing and he's coming back and I don't know, is it even okay for us to go ahead and get married? Should we break it off or should we stay? And this is another one of those situations where Paul is giving them advice based on his experience and his wisdom. And he answers their question like this. He says, now regarding your question about young, men, or young women who are not yet married, I don't have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and so I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage, and if you don't have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it's not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it's not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I'm trying to spare you from those troubles. And so we see again that Paul believes that in light of what's going on in the world, and for him this is a crisis, right? This crisis where Jesus is coming back, time is running out, and um, everyone is going to have to face Judgment Day, right? So this crisis is coming, and his goal is for everyone to be focused on Christ and on that crisis, right? And so he kind of gives them the same explanation 
that he gave in last week's text. It's okay if you're married, but it's even better in Paul's eyes to be single because then you can stay focused on the Lord. And so then we're going to skip down to verse 32 to kind of finish this thought, all right? He says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm not saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks that he's treating his fiance improperly and will inevitably give in to his passion, then let him marry her as he wishes. That's not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiance does well and the person who doesn't marry does even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. And if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I'm giving you counsel from God's spirit when I say this. And so do you hear that over and over again from Paul? What matters is how devoted you are to the Lord. All right, and there you see that piece of advice that if a woman does remarry, it's only okay if he is devoted to Christ as well, right? Because a married couple who are both devoted to Christ can do great things for the Lord, right? Or a single person who puts God first can do great things for the Lord. So either way, we see his advice coming through. And all of that is in light of this very short time that they have left until the return of Jesus. Focus on what matters and stay where you are. And especially when it comes to the things that we tend to focus on that we probably shouldn't. Now let's go back and read verses 29 through 31. He says, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not only focus on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world, as we know it, will soon pass away. So you see, it's not just about marriage, right? It's also about where is your passion where is your mind all the time? And so it's so easy for us to focus on the joy that we have or sometimes the sorrows that we have. And others of us have problems with, with possessions, right? How is it that I have 70 pair of shoes and I can't stop looking at new ones, right? You know, sometimes those things we have seem so important. But what he's saying is that they're, they're not. They don't matter. Focus on what matters. And this kind of reminds me of the same spirit from Galatians 3 where he said there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. Are you familiar with that verse? And, and he's not saying that those things don't matter, but what he's saying is that when it comes to our relationship with Christ, it doesn't matter. Your identity is not found in whether you are a Jew or a Gentile or whether you are slave or free or whether you are male or female. That's not your identity. Your identity is, do you belong to Christ? That's what matters. And that's how we should find ourselves. And when we identify that way too, that's where unity comes. That's why it says, for we are all one in Christ. How is that possible? Because we don't care about all the other things and all the other labels and all the other priorities that the world wants to focus on. What matters is we belong to Jesus. That's our identity. And then we live it out, right? Should I stay or should I go? Here's how I think Paul would answer that in a sentence. As long as you can be obedient to God where you are, stay there. Right where you are. And serve him. And then trust him to open the doors that you need to walk through. Right? 
I hope that's been your experience, that sometimes when I focus on staying right where I am, that's where I see God going, okay, now I want you to go here next, because you did good, right? Whoever's faithful and little will be given much. So stay where you are and be faithful where you are. And what does it mean to be faithful? To obey his commands, right? That's what it means. Another way to say this, one of my favorite sayings, bloom where you're planted, God has you where you are for a reason, so bloom where you are. Now, you may feel like a daisy in the middle of a cow field, right? But maybe that field needed a daisy for a reason that you can't even see. Do you see how that applies to our lives today? Clearly, I think when we look back at all that Paul said, he had a greater sense of urgency. He was... He was watching for Jesus to return. And so we can read that now and go, he got it wrong. But you know, if he didn't have that sense of urgency, is it possible that the gospel would not have spread the way it did? Because Paul lived with that urgency all the time. And because of his faithfulness and that sense of urgency, the gospel spread and churches grew and more people became a part of the kingdom. And it went on from generation to generation and we're Christians today because of Paul's sense of urgency along with the others who were spreading the gospel. But just because Jesus didn't come back when they may have expected doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the same sense of urgency. It's possible that Jesus will return any day now. Do you know that? Jesus could return before we even get home today. When he returns, we will stand in judgment before him and before our holy God. And we will either go to Jesus and be in heaven with him, or we will go to hell and be separated from him. There is no other alternative. One day Jesus is coming back. And at that day we will face him and give an accounting for was our heart really in line with his. And I, don't, I like to think that that's not so much a list of I did this, this, and this, and I, I didn't do this, this, and this. I don't think it's about the list. I think is do you have a heart that's so set on Jesus that you won't accept anything that he wouldn't approve of or be glorified by remember that whole is it good for you is it wise does it glorify God that's the kind of relationship that when we face Jesus we can say yes Lord that was my life's cry and I put you first above my own pleasure above my own desires above my own plans and on that day we will see heaven It could happen today. We should live with that sense of urgency, shouldn't we? We don't because, you know, maybe I lived with that urgency yesterday and then he didn't come. And so today I'm tired of it, right? But no, you don't know. Every day we should live with a sense of urgency to honor God with everything we do and to share him with others so that they can know him too. We like to convince ourselves that there's plenty of time, that we can be obedient to him later Or we can talk to that person about Jesus next week. But what if we don't get that chance? Would what you do with your Sunday afternoon change if you knew that today was your last one? What if you don't get another Sunday? Would your focus change if you knew that everything around you was about to fall away? It wouldn't matter how many shoes you had or what furniture was in your home. Would you have conversations with people that you love? Those resentments wouldn't matter anymore. The fears that you have about talking to them about Jesus wouldn't matter anymore if this was your last Sunday. Would you want to make sure that you were right with God if today was your last Sunday? I hope so. Because the truth is it could be. 
And maybe it won't. But what I learned from that is if I wouldn't be doing it in what I knew to be the last week of my life on this earth, would I do it now? Should I do it now? Maybe we should have that same sense of calling to bloom where God has us today and quit putting it off or waiting for another season. And this, this is really what I think God wants us to know from this message, okay? God has you where you are for a reason. It's not an accident. You didn't just stumble into where you live or where you work or the people who are in your lives. He has you there for a reason. And so when he says to live into the calling that God gave you, what that means is bloom right now where you are for him. Tell the people around you how much Jesus loves you. Have those awkward conversations with your neighbor or coworker. What if they don't talk to you again? What if they do? What if they find Jesus? What if you have to watch them stand before Jesus one day and they go, I didn't know anything about you. And it's because you kept your mouth shut. You see, wherever you go, where you work or even if you don't work, where you live, where you shop, where you dine, where you go to church, all of these are assignments from God that he has you on to do his will in that place. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be obnoxious and be like, you know, evangelizing everywhere you go, right? Sometimes it's a matter of living the life that he has called you to live. And I think that's what he's saying to the Corinthians let him change your character and your behaviors. But your situation, the things around you, really doesn't matter. Trust that God has you in that place for a reason because of what he's doing inside of you. And as you live for him, he will be glorified in that place. If you are in a dark place, if you're trapped in a place that you're not happy and you think, how could this be God's will? Can I just encourage you to be the light that shines into that darkness? If you're in a place of uncertainty and you, you know you've got to move on and you've got to do something, but you don't know what that is, can I encourage you to let God show you where that is? He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Where does he want you to go? What's the job he wants you in? Where's the home he wants you to have? which is the relationship he has designed for you. We need to stop thinking about what we would do for God if we were somewhere else or with somewhere else and start looking at what does he want me to do right now because this is the time of your calling. It's not next year. It's not next Sunday. It's not after vacation or after graduation. It's right now. God has put a calling on each one of your lives not to just be a Christian, but to be a Christian where you are in 2021, to make an impact on the lives around you, to be a witness to those who are watching you, and to make a generational impact. What you do now to love, teach, or disciple others changes them, and then it trickles out from their lives into other lives into other lives all because you decided to be obedient where you are. And that situation that you may think is awful could be a sacred assignment from God, either to teach you something or to prepare you for the next assignment or to glorify him in that terrible place. It's not an accident. Should I stay or should I go? It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you glorify him where you are at the moment. Instead of asking God to change our situations, maybe we just need to ask him what his purpose is in the situation that we're in. The calling in my life may be different than the calling in your life, but that doesn't mean it's any more urgent, does it? 
I love thinking about that in each person in this room and in this church. And what is God's calling on your life? What is he looking for you to do that no one else can do like you? And if you don't know what that calling is in your life, then you know what you can do? You can look for holy answers. You can look in the scriptures. You can talk to people who have godly wisdom. And you can pray that the Holy Spirit would guide you. I wonder what each of my days would look like if I woke up in the morning and said, God, show me who you want me to love on today. Or God, show me who I need to speak to about you today. Or show me who it is that I need to invest in. We talk a lot about asking God for things like that and for help like that. Sometimes, though we say that we want to hear from God, but we don't really listen to God. Sometimes we spend so much time praying to God and asking Him questions that we're never quiet long enough to hear what he's saying to us. If that's a situation that you find yourself in, then here's my encouragement to you. Be quiet. Ask him to show you. Get out a journal and write in it, Lord, what would you have me do today? And then write whatever comes to mind and see if you don't see God's spirit moving your hand. Talk about it with a trusted friend who knows you and who knows Jesus. Talk about what your gifts are and what your situation is and where your passion is. And find it. Don't wait. Don't wait for another day. Don't wait to see if another Sunday comes around. But do something today, right where you are. He saved you for his kingdom and his glory. So will you serve him today? We're going to ask the band if they'll come on back up. And, and I hope that this has given you something to wonder about and to ponder on. You are not here by accident today. You're not. God has something for you to do. Will you, will you look for it? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have a calling on each person's life here today. And Father, I confess that sometimes we get so busy in our lives and so focused on what brings us pleasure that we forget about what brings you joy. And so my prayer, Lord, is that everyone who's hearing this message would cry out to you and say, God, show me your calling and help me to step into it. And help us to know, Lord, that it's it's not about all of those things that don't matter, all of the ways that we identify ourselves away from you. It's just about you. Help us to focus on you, God, above everything else. Married or single, Gentile or Jew, young or old, male or female, none of that matters. What matters is that we belong to you and that we're here to serve you on this day and on each day. Will you guide and direct our lives, Lord? Will you use this little church to change people's lives? Not because they sat among us, Lord, but because they saw you in each of us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's stand and worship, and if you have a need, our altars are open.